the Yalavinda pub. I'd been thinking it might be about time for us to have a go at some of Darcy's big blokes, but he hadn't said anything about us going out on another trip with him, and I didn't like to broach the subject. He would probably say we were welcome because of his being so polite, and I didn't want to take advantage of his good nature. Fifth was thinking about it too. I could tell by one or two things she said. I decided to wait till I'd had a yarn with her about it before asking Darcy, and put the matter aside for the time being. We drank all morning and had lunch at the pub, then we drank on and had dinner there. Although Fifth wasn't drinking much, she was getting very weary, and the party was getting a bit boisterous. A crowd of ringers from a cattle run were having the time of their lives. I decided to take Fifth away and camp somewhere. When Darcy finished a foreign song, he was singing over and over. I told him Fifth and I were going to camp down for the night. He seemed genuinely so sorry. We were going and carefully drew a map on the bar with a finger dipped in beer, showing us a good place to camp on the bank of the Manara River, up from the bridge three miles out of town. We could drive right up to it, and no one would disturb us there. He didn't know where he was going that night or what he was doing, but he'd meet us in the pub next morning at 6 o'clock. I told him it was a bit early, and he said that was all right. He'd wait right there in the bar for us, even if it took all day. He seemed most anxious for us to come, and I had to tell him several times we'd definitely be there. He came out to the Land Rover with us and we all shook hands, thanked each other for something or other, and Fiff and I hopped in and drove away. Prashkovic came from under the blit to help Darcy see us off. It was as sad as a parting. We couldn't find the exact spot Darcy had described for us, but we found one that looked just as good. We cuddled and talked till we went to sleep. I dreamed about crocodiles and talked in my sleep, according to Fifth, who woke me up early next morning because she was lonely. Darcy's Blitz was parked under some trees about a hundred yards away with a tarpaulin and a harpoon rope trailing over one side. We lit a fire and cooked something for breakfast. Brushkovic came over to say good morning and Fifth suggested seeing Darcy about having us back. I said we'd never left him, and she said I knew what she meant, and if I didn't, she was going straight over to ask him herself. So I poured a pannikin of tea for Darcy and wandered over to have a yarn with him. I told Fifth to stay behind because she might spoil it. So she was full of advice about what to say to him because I didn't take any notice. You'd think a joker was going to fight him or something. Darcy was sitting up in his swag against a wheel of the blitz. He didn't look too bright on it, but he was glad of the brew of tea. We talked around for a while, and then I asked him if there was any chance of me borrowing his harpoon quill for the bloke at the garage to make me one the same. He said he had a spare one I could have and wanted to find it for me right there and then but I told him there was no hurry. Then I asked him if he knew where I could get a dinghy, like his, and he said it was very hard to get dinghies around here. We talked around some more, and I asked him where was the best place to get on to the big blokes. He said that some of the biggest, cunningest, cunningest old crocs in the Gulf were living further up the very river we were camped on. He'd been thinking of having a go at them himself for quite a while. Of course, I told him I wouldn't dream of going anywhere where he wanted to shoot himself, and he said no. I thought of it first, and he wouldn't interfere with my river. The only thing for us to do, he reckoned, was to share my river and his boat. It is better for two men to handle those big blokes anyway. We will have to go 50-50% in the supplies and the skins we will get and work the Menara both together. 
I pretended to think it over very carefully for a couple of seconds before I agreed. Darcy had to wait around Yaloginda for a day or two because he was expecting word about something. He wanted to get some stuffer stuff to send up to the annual race meeting at Gregory in a week or so. And if Fifth was still interested, he'd be pleased to teach her how to do them. I said I'd let her know. Brushkovic came back with me to tell Fifth as though he'd arranged the whole thing. I told her how I'd put it straight to Darcy, and he'd begged us to help him out on a trip up the Menara, and how I'd demanded half the skin money we got. That was to teach her a lesson for doubting I was game to ask Darcy in the first place. I made him stick to his promise about teaching you how to do the stuffers, too, I told her. He's doing some later to show you. I wish that dog of Darcy's hadn't been there, though I felt a bit silly about telling lies in front of him after he'd heard what really happened. He was disconcerting at times the way he looked at a man. Or perhaps it was just my guilty conscience. Fifth was worried that I might have offended Darcy at first, but when he came over for something to eat, you could see he was anything but offended. We talked about our trip up to up the Manara for a while, and then Darcy and I drove into Yaloginda to see if the word he was waiting for had arrived yet. In the bar of the pub, there was a dirty, big groper someone had caught in the river. They'd brought it into the pub to show everyone, and it was still there, because nobody knew quite what to do with it. It was easily the biggest fish like that I'd ever seen. It weighed over 200 pounds, and by the time Darcy and I walked in, it was beginning to smell like it. It lay wetly in the middle of the floor with a black cloud of flies around it, and a smell almost as tangible. The publican said he'd arranged for Stoneball Jackson to take it away somewhere, but he hadn't got round to it yet. Stoneball Jackson was an old prospector who pensioned himself off on the miner's sustenance every now and again for a spell in the smoke, as he called Yaloginda. When he'd had his spell, he'd take to the hills again for a year or so. It was said he'd found enough rich strikes to keep him in luxury for the rest of his life, but he was happier the way he was and sat on them. He was always talking about providing for his old age, but seeing that he was over 60 already, it didn't ring terribly true. He was a bit of a nuisance at times, accidentally drinking your beer or picking fights with people half his age and twice his size, but you couldn't help liking him. He lived in the shell of a burnout car in a patch of scrub half a mile from the pub. When he was in town and he had stakes driven in all along the track in case he got lost on his way to the pub in the mornings. He was two hours later than usual this particular morning and when he did arrive you could see he'd been waiting for the price of shifting the groper to go up. It was doing that every minute. If the smell was any indication, when are you going to take that fish out of here, Stoneball? The publican asked him. Stoneball Jackson lifted a couple of empty beer cans and shook them to see if there was anything left and said, Give us a can on the cuff, will you boss? What about that fish? asked the publican. What about that can? asked Stoneball Jackson patiently. The publican opened a can and banged it down on the bar in front of him. Now, when are you going to shift that fish? he demanded. Stoneball Jackson took a long pull of his can and turned to look at the groper on the floor. Getting a bit ripe, he observed. I know, it's getting bloody ripe, said the publican. You were supposed to shift it out of here yesterday. I already paid you thirty bob for doing it. Yeah, I know, said Stoneball Jackson, drinking from his can again. I was thinking you drove a hard bargain there, boss. Expecting a man to shift a stinking thing like that for a lousy 30 bob. The publican was getting a bit worried. Look, Stoneball, he said, are you going to shift that thing or aren't you? You know bloody well it wasn't stinking when I paid you to shift it. Yeah, that's right, said Stoneball Jackson, but we may never made any allowance for me having to find somewhere to put it. That all takes time and money. 
throw it in the river, bury it, burn it, I don't care what you do with it, said the publican. Just so long as you get it out of here like you promised. It's your job to find somewhere to put it. I have found somewhere to put it, explained Stonewall Jackson patiently. But while I've been arranging that end of it, the job's gotten a little more difficult. He kicked the groper lightly with his boot, and an angry buzz of flies warmed up around him, and the publican pulled a face. I reckon you couldn't get a man to shift that thing for under three quid the way it is now. It's going to present difficulties, he added solemnly. The publican agreed to pay the money in the finish, cursing Stonewall Jackson for a thieving old bastard. Stonewall fetched a terpolin, spread it out on the floor, rolled the leaking, dripping brown carcass of the grouper onto it, and dragged it out the door. Wouldn't have lasted much longer, he said innocently. We went outside to see what he was going to do with it. He dragged it up the road to the police sergeant's place and rolled it off the tarpaulin in the garden. Then he came back and threw the tarpaulin back on Darcy's blitz. He offered to wash the floor of the bar down for ten bob, but the publican seemed to think he'd been used up quite enough for one day and did the job himself. Half an hour later, a message came that Stonewall Jackson was wanted over at the sergeant's place. Right away, we watched poor Stoneball from the pub window digging the dead groper into the sergeant's garden. It took him over an hour to get it all hacked up and buried. The publican was in fits of delight. Stoneball Jackson had outwitted himself at last, but Stoneball Jackson didn't look very outwitted when he came back into the bar. He got a can of beer and settled down with a satisfied look on his face. You fell in that time, didn't you? laughed the publican. Fell in, said Stonewall Jackson. How do you mean? We saw you burying that groper in the sergeant's garden, scoffed the publican. You should have taken my advice and thrown it in the river. Like hell, said Stonewall Jackson. I sold that groper to the sergeant yesterday for ten bob, for manure for his pumpkins. I left it till it was a bit ripe before I took it over so I'd get the job of digging it in. Quid an hour he paid me, have a look, and he produced the money to prove it. Darcy was so entertained he didn't even go crook about his tarpaulin, which was in a hell of a mess. It was a torn old thing anyway. He threw it behind the pub because it was stinking up the gear on his blitz, and Stonewall Jackson washed it in the river and cut himself a new swag cover out of it. Having a lot of money would take all the fun out of life for a man like Stonewall Jackson. A couple of days later I saw the publican lend him a fiver because he was running a bit low on ready cash. They're, they were good mates really and the constant blues they were having took the place of friendly gossiping and was far more fun. The word Darcy was waiting for hadn't come by half past two in the afternoon though he didn't go near the post office or check up with anyone. So I drove back to the camp on the river bank to see if Fifth was all right. She had a good fire going against a low bank and was baking loaves of camp oven bread and boiling our dirty clothes. She was so busy I wished I'd stayed at the pub with Darcy, but I did a bit of work on the Land Rover instead. The Blitz bounced up drunk just after dark and Darcy nearly fell into the fire and then into the river. I rolled him into the, to his swag and left Prashkovitz to keep an eye on Tim. Fifth and I talked till very late and woke up bad-tempered too early next morning. That was a hell of a day. The water in the river was salty and fresh. Water had to be carted from Yagolinda in drums. Fifth wanted us to get a load of water because she'd used nearly all we had doing the washing the day before, and I didn't want to. We drove into town in tempers. Darcy was too hangovery to get up yet, and had a hell of a row about something or other. She got out to walk in the finish, and I said I was shooting through to Normanton and headed off with skidding wheels along the Normanton Road. 
I decided I didn't have enough petrol to get me to Normanton then, so I drove over to an old black fellow's humpy out on the plane and brought a six weeks old dingo pup, swarming with ticks from him. He was a jolly f looking bloke and as crafty as they come. We bargained and argued for about half an hour and the price went from five bob to two quid and back again. Eventually I gave him his two quid and tore back to Yaloginda flat out in case Fifth thought I would really gone to Normanton and chased off after me. She was talking to the cop's wife outside the store so I drove slowly past looking the other way and wondering how to get rid of the pup. There was no need for it anymore. It was a good chance to go to the pub anyway. No one around the pub wanted a dingo pup covered with ticks so I took it back to Fifth and she sat in the hot shade under the store building picking the ticks off it. To hell with hanging around here so I snarled at Fifth a bit and went back to the pub. Darcy wasn't there and Stonewall Jackson wasn't very entertaining but I stuck it out for a couple of hours and then went back to be nice to Fifth. At the store, they said she'd walked off down the road with a pup under her arm. I flew into a bit of a panic. Some well-meaning idiot who didn't know any better had probably picked her up and taken her right through to Normanton. She was just in the mood to do it too. So back to the pub, dragged the bloke out of the bar to open up his garage. Fill the Land Rover with gas, top up the spare drum, and flat out after the old dragon. She had no right to go charging off like that without telling a man. I told her when I was going to Normanton, what's the big attraction there? Anyway, couldn't she think of a place of her own to run away to? She'd probably pick up the swag from the camp on her way past, too. I'd teach her to leave a man with no swag to sleep in. I hit the Manara River Bridge approach a bit on the fast side and nearly hit the rail. There she was, sitting on the bridge fishing. My good fishing line too, not much use going crook at her though. Then she had the cheek to go crook at me for smacking the new pup for trying to pinch her bait. She'll make a thief out of the flaming thing. Have to get rid of it, it's only going to be a nuisance. I took Fifth back to the camp and pretended I was going to leave her there while I went back to the pub. When we walked into the bar, the garage bloke went a bit snotty about me not having to go to Normanton, urgently after all, and wasting all the trouble he'd gone to. We only stayed for one drink and then went back to camp to have a yarn with Darcy. On the way out to the river, I could see Fifth grinning at me. I drove on for a while, not noticing, and then turned around to call her a Cheshire bitch, but I grinned by accident and ruined it. Darcy got up for a feed. We opened two cans of beef and sat round the fire talking till it got dark. I sat there yarning with Darcy for a couple of hours about fifth, hit the swag, and when I crawled under the net she mumbled something about not fooling her one little bit. I didn't know what the hell she was talking about. I was going to tell her not to be so stupid, but it's one of our rules that no one's allowed to go crook after we're in bed at night. So I put her head on the right place on my shoulder and lay there, listening to the river noises fading away in the darkness beyond the fire. What a crazy day. That's what happens when you've got nothing to do but wait around. Hope the word Darcy's waiting for comes tomorrow. Next morning, Darcy and I went into town again to see if his word had arrived yet and found quite a crowd of people there. A traveling carnival had arrived on the back of a five-ton truck. The main attraction seemed to be a boxer who would take all corners for a five or a time. The rest of the show appeared to be nothing but stands where they sold sweets and soft drinks and things. Honest, it wasn't much of an outfit. That's literally all there was of it. But for Yalogina, 
it was quite an event. It was going to start at 8 o'clock that night, and there was quite a crowd in the bar getting ready for it. The boxer and the boss of the carnival were spouting about what a great show they were going to put on, and shouting themselves beer, beer lavishly. The boxer looked like a real thug. He was trying to jack up someone to fight him that night, but he was having a hard time even getting anyone to talk to him. They looked like a couple of spruckers to me. Stoneball Jackson offered to fight the pair of them there and then, but they just laughed at him and called him Pop and Granddad. So he swiped the boxer's can of beer and retired to the far end of the bar to tell everyone what a gutless pair of dingoes they were. Darcy and I had a can or two each and then drove back to camp in the Land Rover to get Fifth. The way Darcy had described to show the show to Fifth was a bit misleading, and we had to wait out of sight for nearly an hour while she chose a dress and face gear to wear to what she was determined to think of as a circus. When we drove back into town, there was a faded striped tent flapping limply beside the carnival truck on a section between the pub and the store, and shelves of colored boxes of chocolates and sweets and things were being set up on the tray of the truck. Where's all the animals, said Fifth. We went into the bar where we found that the main part of the show was over. Stoneball Jackson had clobbered the boxer bloke with a bar stool and broke it in his nose and split his eyebrow. The boxing spectacle was off, but the rest of the show would be going on just the same. The greatest selection of sweets, chocolates, soft drinks, balloons, lollies, whistles, doll, candy, toys, and chewing gum ever to hit Yellow Ginda would be on sale in the Big Top at 8 o'clock sharp. Stoneball Jackson was asleep on the floor with his head propped up on a beer can and a borrowed hat to keep the noise out of his eyes. He used to say that the racket of a crowded bar was better than a lullaby. We waited around for the carnival to start because of all the trouble Fifth had gone to getting ready and then bought a few bags of lollies. Darcy bought Fifth a whistle that unrolled when you blew it and an out-of-season Easter egg. Then we went back to camp because fights were starting outside the pub. Fifth put on a big belly of strong tea to take the taste of the carnival out of our mouths, and we hit the sack early. Darcy was restless that night. He came and squatted, talking for hours outside our mosquito net. Fifth carried on sleeping, but I sat up and asked him if it was not true about big crocs dragging horses and cattle into rivers and drowning them for food. Some of the big blokes dragged cattle and horses into the rivers, he said. Sometimes far more than themselves they can eat. They just leave them to float around for the other crocs to eat from and wait for the cattle to arrive back to drink again. But don't the cattle know there's crocs in the river? Yes, the cattle know about the crocs, but in this country it is often 50 miles between water holes and many cattle must drink from the brackish river water. That is where the crock waits. There are not many places where the cattle can easily get to the water because of the steep banks. You understand? Once they start drinking, they tread on the mud and make the water dirty. So they crowd out into the clear water till they are up to their bellies. Cattle like to wallow. The old crock has many opportunities. But how do the crocks get hold of the cattle, Darcy? They just move slowly up to one they have chosen and suddenly snatch sideways at it. Then they sink with its head in their jaws. The weight of the croc is more than the cattle can pull away from it and is drowned. What about pigs and things like that, Darcy? The croc can kill a pig or wallaby by crushing with his teeth, said Darcy. I once found where a croc had stolen a boar pig from the mud among some mangroves in an estuary. The strength of the croc's jaw had broken the pig's stomach all over the trees around. Hell, how do they catch a wallaby? I once saw a 12-foot croc watching a wallaby hopping along the riverbank. When the wallaby was some yards away, the croc shouted loudly and ran 
and wriggled across to it, faster than any man could run. The wallaby was so surprised he forgot to run away. The croc snatched him and took him into the river very fast. There was much blood on the grass and other stuff. How big is a croc before he becomes a man-eater? I asked. Not all big crocs are man-eaters. Also, they are not all cattle killers. Cattle and horses have only arrived in most of this country in the lifetime of one big bloke, and no crocodile lives only on men although some very old ones will sometimes tip over a canoe to get at the people because they cannot get food in easier ways. Some of the biggest crocs I have killed have been slow and stupid, living just on mud crabs and fish and estuaries along the coast. But if a croc has to get rough to make a living, he is very prepared and able to do it. Otherwise, he is happy to live quietly. Do they have to have salty water to live in? Darcy. No, a croc is very versatile, what is probably the reason for their survival. I found quite a big salty seven miles from any water at all, and others in freshwater lagoons many miles from the sea or river. When these water holes begin to dry up, the crocs will travel many miles to another place where there is more water, over country where a man would die of thirst or get lost. They have often been seen swimming far out to sea. They live on islands and beaches and in swamps and creeks and rivers, wherever there is food and water and warmth for them. Darcy was just a natural encyclopedia. He even talked like one when we got him going. Have they got any natural enemies? Not once they grow to be big, Darcy replied. The one big enemy of the crocodile is a crock shooter, and that is only very recently, after the hunter the real enemy of the croc is not the rifle or the net or the snare or poison or old age, but the little spotlight. You will catch a few crocs by sneaking along the banks with your rifle, but only the spotlight is a match for the cunning of an educated crocodile. Until the croc shooter with his spotlight came along, there were many hungry cock crocodiles in the rivers and lagoons, and since the light has done what time has failed to do, and has reduced their numbers to what they are, then there should be, should now be plenty of food left for the remaining ones. The croc should therefore be not so dangerous to stock and swimmers as the same croc was 50 years ago. He went on and on for hours about crocodiles, about the unaccountable mystery of their appearances and disappearances in rivers. Now, one night, a big bloke you've been after for months will swim up to the light as though it's his turn for the harpoon, and the unexplainable something that tells an apparently sleeping croc that he's been sneaked up on. A croc is a coward when he is attacked and fearless when he is attacking. I have never known a croc to make an unpremeditated attack but I have known of many times when a croc has watched for days or weeks before he attacks. Perhaps they are not hungry at first, I suggested. Many crocodiles with full bellies I have shot while they are trying to sneak up on a dog or wallaby in the water. The croc has a liking for dogs. The croc will let a wallaby go and will take a dog every time. A dog of mine was holding a pig in the shallow water... <coughs> at the edge of a river, and he was taken by this croc. It carried my dog across the river and climbed out onto the mud bank and broke it up with its teeth and ate it. That was in a branch river that I don't think has ever been shot before. The crocs there were so cheeky that after my dog was stolen, I moved my camp to a hill half a mile away from the river. Do they come out on the banks in the daytime much Darcy? While the water is warm, the crocs will stay in it much of the time, but when the water runs cool in winter, they lie out on the bank sometimes. Nothing is certain except the uncertainty. What is the biggest croc you've ever got, Darcy? I killed many thousands of crocodiles, said Darcy, but never one over 18 feet long. I believe that they grow to 20 feet long and more, but 50 or 60 18-footers is all I can say I've killed. He was actually apologetic as he said this, but I am dreaming always that one day I will be killing a 20-footer. How old do they grow to 
I asked. I do not know, but I think some of the really old ones are more than a hundred years. There are many arguments about this. Would they make good pets? No, they do not make pets, even bad ones. No man can really learn to know a croc because we can only compare the way they behave with the way people behave, and there is no comparison. A dog is aggressive or cowardly, a bird is timorous, a fish is nervous, a boar is brave, and will stand and fight when he is attacked. A rat is sneaky. All these things we can understand. We can even say of a shark that it is a moving appetite, and that is the nearest thing to a crocodile I could think of as far as the behavior concerned. But no man ever made a friend of a crocodile. You can take one from the egg, feed it, and keep it happy for all your life. Then it will kill you because it is a crocodile. And crocodiles and men are more different than hot and cold. It is the difference of millions of years. A crocodile has been overlooked by time. Daylight was sneaking through the trees when Darcy rose and walked stiffly through the lifting shadows to his lonely bed. I wouldn't have missed that talk at any price. Sleep can be caught up on, but a man like Darcy in a mood like that is a rare thing. The, there were things he told me about crocodiles that I never proved for myself, but I never discovered anything on which he was wrong, even his theories. According to a book Fifth wrote away for, all they know about crocs is that they are the bulkiest of all living reptiles grow from 16 to 30 feet long and have been hanging around for well over 100 million years without changing their shape, style of living, or their stamping grounds much. About the crocodiles as they are today, I think Darcy knew a lot more than any book could have told us. At that stage, I hadn't even seen a saltwater crocodile, but Darcy's reports and comments were as convincing as the cow I was to see later standing hopelessly out on the plain with its bottom jaw torn away. Crocs and Stuffers It was late in the morning when we got up for breakfast. Darcy and I went off to the pub to see if his word had arrived yet and to pick up the Blitz. We'd left it there the night before, and Darcy had come home in the Land Rover. When we got to the pub, the carnival was gone, and so was the Blitz. There was a message for Darcy that his friend on a station had taken the loan of it for a day or two, so it was all right, except that all our crock shooting gear was on the back of it, and Pershkovitz had nothing to sit under and guard. The Land Rover was too low to the ground for him. I was anxious to get after those big blokes up the Menara River, and over a can of beer I asked Darcy exactly what was this word he was waiting for. Word to make another trip, he said, patting his pocket significantly. When this is empty, I am ready to go and get some more croc skins. I prefer to be a poor croc shooter than a rich man with no work. This way, I have no boss to say, Darcy, you must do this work, or I shall send you to look for a new job. Where the boss will say, Darcy, you must do this work. I get, I got the point. Darcy and I drank quite a lot of beer that day. In fact, it was a hell of a lot. Around dark, I left Darcy enjoying himself in the pub and drove back to the camp to give a bit of cheek to fifth. I fell out of the Land Rover, staggered across, and passed out at her feet, with a hole in my pants, <clears throat> so she reckoned. Next morning, I heard strange voices and opened one eye to have a look. I saw that I was the only one left in the swag. Another wagon was parked beside ours, and two prospectors who brought Darcy home the night before were eating damper around a bottle of OP rum on the bonnet. When I got up, I found that they were Bob the old bloke, and Dick, who was only a young bloke like me. Darcy was crooker than I was, and I'd been seen in much better condition than I was then. 
Bob was a typical old prospector. He had the usual kind of prospecting yarns that everybody likes listening to. He'd discovered a pretty terrific copper show a few years back, but some big mining company had found something wrong with the way his claim was registered and moved in without paying him a cracker. The court case was still coming up. He could track like a black fellow, and he'd done time in Fanny Bay for cattle duffing when he was a young bloke, and he drank OP rum out of the bottle as though it was ordinary petrol without turning a hair. Dick was quite sort of bloke, but friendly enough. He blushed whenever Fifth looked at him and whenever she didn't. When she spoke to him, he'd stammer and shuffle his feet in the dirt, poor sod. Fifth wanted to go out to the big salt pan beyond Yaloginda to see some mirages we'd been hearing about. Bob wasn't interested in mirages, and Darcy was still too crook to be interested in anything, so they stayed behind. Me, Fifth, and Dick crowded into the Land Rover and went off to see the mirages. We saw them all right, but there wasn't much to see. Just black lines of trees and hills lifted a few feet off the horizon and trembling in waves of heat. Fifth was quite indigent and said how mirages should be right up in the sky and only when you're dying of thirst. But we saw a dingo sliding furtively through the Mitchell grass and three graceful big dancing birds that stood five feet high and in a row and bounced out of step for us as light as balloons till Fifth started clapping and frightened them into dancing away across the salt pan as though they were caught in a strong wind. Dick shot a wallaby with the .222 for meat for Prushkovitz. It was a pleasant afternoon. That night, we all planned to get away to other camps next day. We hit the sack early and sober for a change. In the morning, we packed up our gear but couldn't get away, so all the men went to the pub instead. At the pub, there was a message saying Darcy's Blitz would be back there tomorrow tomorrow morning and we decided to go up the river next day by road and across country and set up a camp to work from. Action at last. That night we took some beer back to the camp for a big breakup party but fifth didn't feel like it. Darcy had already had enough. I was too sick and Dick was already asleep so Bob had to have a party on his own which he made quite a tidy little job of. The man was undrunkable. Next morning, we said goodbye all around and drove off in opposite directions. When we reached Yaloginda, Darcy found something to be really outraged about. The Blitz was there, all right, but his gear was in such a mess it was going to take him a full day to find out what was missing and what was only broken. Our little dinghy was split along one side where it had landed on something, Fifth and I waited silently for the blast while Darcy surveyed the mixture. He picked an axe off the tray of the blitz, looked at the split handle for a moment, and then put it gently back again. The man has been very careless, he said. Where is he, I asked. We'll make the bastard fix this up. No, said Darcy, shaking his head. One day, this man will want again to borrow something from me or ask for my help. Then he will regret his lack of respect for my property. We bought fuel and supplies and drove off across the plain on a long on a, the road along which Fifth and I first came to Yaloginda. About 15 miles out, we turned off on a set of wheel tracks that took us back towards the Manara River. On a grassy bank above the river, Fifth and I set out a camp while Darcy patiently began to sort through the gear. He was still at it by dark. Next morning, he and I crossed the river in the badly leaking dinghy and set off along the opposite bank upstream, looking for signs of crocs. We had the .222 bare feet, shorts, knives, and Prushkovitz, and were on the wrong side of the river. Three times we heard the sudden rushing splash from under the bank we were walking along, but we were too close to the croc to see them. If we'd been across the river, we'd at least have had a chance to look across to them. 
The vegetation on the 20-foot bank between us and the mass of reeds at the water's edge made it impossible for us to see them. Where the first croc went splashing in beneath us, we followed a wallaby track down through the scrub and found a private little beach with scattered bones. A wet slide where the big bloke had gone into the water gave me a thrill to guess at his size, at least 18 feet. Hell, Darcy, I whispered, he's a big bloke. Darcy, glancing at, that, at the slide, nodded and said, yes, about 12 feet long. Darcy was good at telling tracks from having lived among the blacks. He could tell at a glance things you'd never guess were possible to learn from marks on the ground. And he'd explain the how and why of them too. It was much more impressive than any inscrutable faced inch by inch examination and taciturn diagnosis could ever have been. I'd been standing well back from the water on the Crocs little beach out of respect for the size of that slide, even though it was only made by a 12-footer. Darcy leaned the rifle against the bank, walked out through the reeds, dived in, and swam a few strokes out into the river. I grabbed the rifle, sure that he'd gone stark staring mad. What the hell are you doing? I shouted. Washing the sweat off myself so I won't be so easily smelt by the crocs further along, he replied. Come and wash yourself. What about the crocs? This is one time he will not touch us. It is too sudden for him. He will have to think about us before he makes up his mind. <clears throat> when he decides, we will be gone already. Come into the water. It's quite safe. I dived recklessly into the shallows among the reeds and sprang back out as though I was on the end of a big rubber band. To hell with that caper. The next crock we disturbed went into the river with a great slopping surge, and Darcy ran to peer through a gap in the branches, because sometimes they dive in and come straight up again for a look. This one didn't. We went down and found a perfect curving imprint of an enormous crock. Surely this one was well over 18 feet long. Fifteen footer, said Darcy. But look how wide it is. See the size of those claw marks. Yes, once they get to reach 12 or 13 feet, they grow thicker for their length. But look at the width of it. Yes, repeated Darcy patiently, about 15 feet. The next croc we heard was a mere 8 or 10 footer, and that was all we saw that day. Or, I should say heard, because we didn't actually see any of them. On the way back, Darcy said that to see evidence of that many was a probable indication there were at least twice as many in that stretch of river, about two and a half miles. They always lie on a bank with their heads turned towards the water like that, explained Darcy, and these big blokes are never far from deep river. They're uneasy in shallow places. If one moves off in a definite direction when you put the light on him, you can say to yourself that this croc is going to deep water. When he stops or turns around, you can say to yourself, here is where he feels safe. It is the deepest part around here, or the safest in some other way. Then you can prepare to use your harpoon, for it is then that he will let you come close to him if he is going to. It doesn't always happen this way, only often enough to be often. There are so many things to know and be prepared for. The water, the current, the season, the place, the crocodile. I cannot tell a man all these things. Now when my light falls on a crocodile, I could say, this crocodile is mine, but I must be very patient with him, or here is a stupid crocodile who will wait for me to kill him. Or sometimes I say, this crocodile will go down many times and move around beneath the water. Only if I am very lucky will I get this one. Very often I am wrong, there is much to learn. What about the seasons, Darcy? What difference do they make to the croc shooting? But Darcy had said enough about crocs for one day. You will learn that as the seasons pass, he said. If you want to learn about crocodiles, you must try to comprehend a little of what you see now and... Let the experience help you understand what you see later. The seasons will come much faster than knowledge. There is a dust storm coming.
There was, too, a haze in the middle distance that didn't seem to get any closer, till I realized my teeth were gritting on an almost invisible dust that hung in the air almost transparent. We cut a new harpoon pole, and by the time we got back to the camp, the dust was in our very bones. The dust storm hung in the red air for three days, till there came a wind from out in the gulf to take it away again. The water in the river at our camp was not so salty as it had been further down, but it was still far from drinkable. So next day I drove to Yaloginda to fill our drums while Darcy straightened out his gear and mended the dinghy. While I was in town, I dropped into the pub for a beer. There was a traveling jeweler in the bar all the way from Mount Isa. He had a big display of watches and knickknacks set up on the bottom of an upside-down tea chest. He was explaining to, on, to the only other customer the merits of a railway lever. The customer was Stoneball Jackson with mischief in his eye. I didn't wait to see it. I heard later that Stoneball bought one of the jeweler, jeweler's waterproof watches and tested it by soaking it overnight in a mug of beer. Then he demanded his money back and asked the jeweler to fix the watch up for him. When I got back to camp with the water or one or two things for fifth, she had to have them sent from Cairns because they didn't carry things like that at the Yellow Ginda store. Darcy's gear was more or less in order and the glued patch on the dinghy was drying in the sun. Darcy and Fifth were just about to begin her first lesson in stuffing little crocodiles. I never learned how to do it myself, but I've seen Fifth do dozens of them. As far as I can make out, this is how Darcy's method goes. I can guarantee it providing I give you the right instructions and you do them right. From the time a croc comes out of the soft-shelled egg hatched in a hot sand on a riverbank, He's ready to go into business, just as voracious as his old man, only on a smaller scale. Before he and his twenty-odd brothers and sisters reach the water, there are likely to be only ten of them, kookaburras, dingoes, snakes, and things. Everything has a go at them, and when he gets into the river, the sharks and other fish are after him. Even his old man is liable to scoff him if he gets in the way. He lives for a few days or weeks or months or even a couple of years, popping up and down along the overgrown banks, eating crabs, little fish, and things. <clears throat> then one night, Darcy comes, whirling along in his dinghy, and snatches him with a quick grab behind the neck and puts him in a cold, wet sack, along with several of his brothers and sisters or cousins. By morning he is dead, I wonder how many millions of years of potential life Darcy has interrupted. One slit up the stomach is the only opening in the skin. First, skin the body. Take the crock away from his skin. Don't pull the skin off or you shall tear it, says Darcy. Then sleeve skin the hind legs to the first knuckles of the claws, like peeling the stocking off the leg of a woman, only different, and cut them through at the soft white knuckles. Then do the tail, use your common sense. Work the skin off the body to where the brassiere would be if it was a woman. Then the same with the front legs as you did with the back. Ones only leave out the ribs and the knife cuts. They don't really matter for a start. Part the crock from the skin right up to the line of the jaw and base of the skull. Cut through the spine at the ball joint behind the skull. Now you're supposed to have a miniature croc skin with claws and head attached and very little croc still on the inside of the skin. But don't worry, it happens to everybody the first few times. Scrape the skin carefully, dig out the brains, and smother the whole inside of the skin, skull, and legs with salt. Pack the whole thing with salt and then bury it in the salt bag along with all the other little croc skins you've made a botch of. Oh yes, don't forget to dig the eyes out, point of a knife. After three or four days, change the salt. At least three or four days later, and at the most three or four months. 
take the skin and wash all the salt out of it while it's still soft fill the legs with fine dry sawdust and ram it firm with a round stick get your needle and wax thread and stitch the skin in a neat line from the end of the tail to the back legs stuff the tail the same as the legs then sew the stuff till you've got the whole thing packed like a gollywog with the legs and tail straight and firm <clears throat> Now you've got to set it. Bend the legs and curl the tail till they look natural. Belly, tail, and feet all touching the floor is best for the start. You can sit them up on their tail after you've got the knack. Lift the head and prop the jaws open. You'll have found that you have to block the throat with paper to stop the sawdust running out again. By this time you'll have nails and blocks of wood all over the place holding the crop in your realistic position. You can put it out in the sun now. The sun dries and shrinks the skin around the sawdust packing. After a few hours you can tell it's set properly because it won't be floppy anymore. Open your tin of putty and cover the stitching along the belly and any of the knife cuts you've had to patch up. Cover the paper wadding in the throat and smooth over the tongue. Marbles are good for the eyes, or beads, or berries, anything that won't rot. More sun and final adjustment till the putty dries. Now you can get out the clear varnish and give the whole works a good coat, then another. When that dries, you've got the finished article. Even Darcy made a botch of his first few, but now he could do eight footers. He'd even do you an eighteen footer if the price was right. Darcy and Fifth did four stuffers that day, and another four the day after, and Darcy and I took them in to Yaloginda to leave at the pub to be taken to the races at Gregory. The next day Darcy and I had to go to the pub again to give the stuffed crocs in the pub to a bloke in the pub to give to his brother in the Gregory pub, whose mate was going to sell them for us. It was a pretty weak excuse, and I felt a bit lousy about leaving Fifth out at the camp while Darcy and I were celebrating the day before the races at Gregory. Some blokes in a private plane called in on the way to Gregory, so I got them to drop a note in a weighted sack to Fifth at the camp on the river bank to cheer her up a bit. Then I went out there myself to get her in case they dropped the note in the river and she didn't get it. I had a good excuse ready for why I had to come back, but I didn't need it. So I saved it up, still haven't used it, so I won't say what it is. When Fifth and I got back to the pub, Darcy was in great form. Someone had offered him the use of a 15-foot boat and outboard motor. All Darcy had to do was look after three dogs while the bloke was away at the races and bring him back two small live crocs. The live crocs were no trouble, but all those dogs were likely to be, to be a bit of a nuisance. That night, Darcy was to bring the boat up the river to the camp. He took a spotlight and rifle, and we took Prushkovitz, the dingo pup, and the three snarling guests in the Land Rover. I shot two wallabies for Dog Tucker on the way, and Fifth and I were on our own for the first time in weeks. It wasn't much of an evening, though. The dogs howled and barked, and Darcy arrived at about 11 o'clock. He'd shot a 14-foot crop just downriver from the camp. He would have got a bigger one as well, but he hadn't taken the harpoon. I was jealous about not having been in on it. In the morning, we all went down to skin Darcy's 14-footer. It was in a hell of a place, in four feet of water, because the tide was in. Darcy hopped into the water and felt around with his foot till he found the dead croc. Between us, we managed to snig it up into a muddy washout, but its head was still under water. The thing was too big and heavy to take somewhere we could work on it properly. We had to skin it standing up to here in mud, a hell of a job, both of us working on it in awkward, slippery, restricted space. It took us two hours. The difference between salt water and freshwater crocs is not a big one. Apart from the size of it, the salty had a broader, more craggy head and jaws than the finer and scissor-like jaw action of the freshie. 
Blunt and grinning it was, and felt like smoother dark rock with boar tusk teeth, the end ones sticking up through holes in the nose. The jaws fit raggedly but perfectly, like the serrated edge of a key, and you could lift open the top jaw and let it fall shut with a loud wooden clap. Rigor mortis takes a long time to set in, in a dead croc. One of the first things you realize is how helpless a man would be once one of those things grabbed him. You wouldn't have a, a chance. The weight of the skin alone was as much as I could lift and carry through the clutching mud to fifth in the dinghy. Then Darcy did a post-mortem to see what the dead croc had been eating. Bones, quite big ones, the pelvis of a wallaby, no, a dog. Here's a bit of the collar with the buckle and a river still on it, a rivet still on it. Leg bones, pig bristles, balls of wallaby, and cattle dog hair. Four of them the size of tennis balls. More bones and rocks. Round ones, about a dozen, the size of your fist. What are the rocks for, Darcy? Some people would tell you that the rocks in the stomach of a crocodile are to help him digest the bones and things he eats. But I am not believing this. I think the crocodile swallows rocks to balance his buoyancy so he can lie in the bottom of the river without effort and stay on the surface by gently swimming. A croc doesn't dive when he goes down, you understand. He fades down, he sinks. The rocks in his stomach are to help him maintain the correct weight. You will see how only the top edge of his head appears at the surface of the water when he comes up to breathe or watch while his body hangs down at an angle. Only when he is actually swimming along the top of the water does his back show above the surface. Darcy showed me where to place the shots that will kill a big croc best. Always in the head, body shots often only wound them and make holes in the skin. The ear, a slit in the side of the head, two inches behind the eye, is a good place. A tunnel through the bone leads to his brain. Otherwise, you must hit him flat and square and hope the bullet shatters his skull. A 303 at point-blank range will often fail to penetrate a croc's skull. Think of that. Have you ever seen what a 303 does to an axe head? Most of the big skins have rips and holes in them from fighting. Darcy says that a 10 or 12 footer is the best size for first grade skins and the easiest to handle. They fight for sex or to see who's boss in a section of the river or for some other dark crocodile reason. Darcy is not prepared to say. He told us how he was watching a big croc swimming down a river one day. He couldn't shoot at them because the water was too deep, so he decided to have a go at him with the light that night. He just sat there and watched it swimming along. Then another croc, about the same size, 12 or 13 feet, came swimming along from the other direction. Without even changing gear, they swam up to one another, circled a couple of times, and then it was on, chopping and grunting at each other as though it had been put on specially for Darcy's benefit. Then one of the crocs grabbed the other round the base of the tail and hung on. The other grabbed him at the side of the belly and round and round they went till Darcy fired a shot and broke up the fight because they were ruining good croc skins. He got both of them that night, two second grade skins with big holes in them. We fed the dogs when we got back to camp and let them off for, for a run. Then Darcy scraped and salted the croc skins while Fifth baked bread. I smoothed and trimmed our new harpoon pole and dug a neat hole in the thick end with a sharpened screwdriver so the quill fitted firm and smooth into it. Then I bolted and bound the gaff on the other end. After I took the liberty of cleaning up Darcy's rifles a bit and putting a drop of oil here and there, his 303 was shooting 2 inches low and 25 at 25 years. He said he knew about that and allowed for it, so I didn't alter the sights. Darcy and I were going out after the big blokes that night. 